Lesson 8 The Sabbath and the End Sabbath Afternoon May 13 No distinction on account of nationality, race, or caste is recognized by God. He is the maker of all mankind. All men are of one family by creation, and all are one through redemption. Christ came to demolish every wall of partition, to throw open every compartment of the temple, that every soul may have free access to God. His love is so broad, so deep, so full, that it penetrates everywhere. It lifts out of Satan's circle the poor souls who have been deluded by his deceptions. It places them within reach of the throne of God, the throne encircled by the rainbow of promise. In Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free. All are brought nigh by his precious blood. Galatians chapter 3 verse 28 and Ephesians chapter 2 verse 13. Whatever the difference in religious belief, a call from suffering humanity must be heard and answered. Where bitterness of feeling exists because of difference in religion, much good may be done by personal service. Loving ministry will break down prejudice and win souls to God. We should anticipate the sorrows, the difficulties, the troubles of others. We should enter into the joys and cares of both high and low, rich and poor. Freely ye have received, Christ says, freely give. Matthew chapter 10, verse 8. Christ's Object Lessons, page 386. God has shown for human beings an infinite depth of love, and yet how far short we fall of appreciating this love. Christ died on the cross of Calvary that sinners might be redeemed from the slavery of sin and placed on vantage ground before God. Think of the wonderful love that the Father revealed in making this sacrifice. It is ours to point those outside the fold to this love, ours to tell sinners what Christ has done for them and what they may become through His transforming grace. This Day with God, page 269 In words of matchless beauty and tenderness, the Apostle Paul set before the sages of Athens the divine purpose in the creation and distribution of races and nations. God that made the world and all things therein, declared the apostle, hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him. Acts chapter 17, verses 24 to 27. God has made plain that whosoever will may come into the bond of the covenant. Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 37. In the creation, it was his purpose that the earth should be inhabited by beings whose existence would be a blessing to themselves and to one another and an honor to their creator. All who will may identify themselves with this purpose. Of them it is spoken, this people have I formed for myself. They shall show forth my praise. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 21. Prophets and Kings, page 500. Sunday, May 14. The Judgment, Creation, and Accountability. Said Paul, I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. God had revealed his truth to Paul, and in so doing had made him a debtor to those who were in darkness to enlighten them. But many do not realize their accountability to God. They are handling their Lord's talents. They have powers of mind that, if employed in the right direction, would make them co-workers with Christ and his angels. Many souls might be saved through their efforts to shine as stars in the crown of their rejoicing. But they are indifferent to all this. Satan has sought through the attractions of this world to enchain them 
and paralyze their moral powers, and he has succeeded only too well. Councils on Stewardship, page 212. However large, however small the possessions of any individual, let him remember that it is his only in trust. For his strength, skill, time, talents, opportunities, and means, he must render an account to God. This is an individual work. God gives to us that we may become like him, generous, noble, beneficent, by giving to others. Those who, forgetful of their divine mission, seek only to save or to spend in the indulgence of pride or selfishness may secure the gains and pleasures of this world, but in God's sight, estimated by their spiritual attainments, they are poor, wretched, miserable, blind, naked. Councils on Stewardship, page 22. Christ has power from his Father to give his divine grace and strength to man, making it possible for him through his name to overcome. Jesus does not desire those who have been purchased at such a cost to become the sport of the enemy's temptations. He does not desire us to be overcome and perish. He who curbed the lions in their den and walked with his faithful witnesses amid the fiery flames is just as ready to work in our behalf to subdue every evil in our nature. Today he is standing at the altar of mercy, presenting before God the prayers of those who desire his help. He turns no weeping contrite one away. The souls that turn to him for refuge, Jesus lifts above the accusing and the strife of tongues. No man or evil angel can impeach these souls. Christ unites them to his own divine human nature. My Life Today Page 317. In the conflict with satanic agencies, there are decisive moments that determine the victory either on the side of God or on the side of the prince of this world. If those engaged in the warfare are not wide awake, earnest, vigilant, praying for wisdom, watching unto prayer, Satan comes off victor when he might have been vanquished by the armies of the Lord. God's faithful sentinels are to give the evil powers no advantage. He who would overcome must hold fast to Christ. He must not look back, but keep the eye ever upward. Ellen G. White comments in the SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 6, page 1094. Monday, May 15. The Sabbath and Creation Since Christ made all things, he made the Sabbath. By him it was set apart as a memorial of the work of creation. It points to him as both the creator and the sanctifier. It declares that he who created all things in heaven and in earth, and by whom all things hold together, is the head of the church, and that by his power we are reconciled to God. The Sabbath is a sign of Christ's power to make us holy, and it is given to all whom Christ makes holy. As a sign of His sanctifying power, the Sabbath is given to all who, through Christ, become a part of the Israel of God. To all who receive the Sabbath as a sign of Christ's creative and redeeming power, it will be a delight. Seeing Christ in it, they delight themselves in Him. The Sabbath points them to the works of creation as an evidence of His mighty power and redemption. While it calls to mind the lost peace of Eden, it tells of peace restored through the Savior. And every object in nature repeats His invitation, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. The Desire of Ages, pages 288 and 289. The first four commandments were given to show men their duty to God. The fourth is the connecting link between the great God and man. The Sabbath, especially, was given for the benefit of man and for the honor of God. The Sabbath was to be a sign between God and His people forever. In this manner was it to be a sign. All who should observe the Sabbath signified by such observance that they were worshippers of the living God, the Creator of the heavens and the earth. The Sabbath was to be a sign between God and His people as long as He should have a people upon the earth to serve Him. The Story of Redemption, page 141. 
The true Sabbath is to be exalted to its rightful position as God's rest day. In the 58th chapter of Isaiah is outlined the work which God's people are to do. They are to magnify the law and make it honorable, to build up the old waste places, and to raise up the foundations of many generations. To those who do this work, God says, Thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shalt honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words, then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth, and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Verses 12 to 14. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 6, page 352. Tuesday, May 16. A Not So Subtle Deception. God spoke, and His words created His works in the natural world. God's creation is but a reservoir of means made ready for Him to employ instantly to do His pleasure. Infinite love, how great it is! God made the world to enlarge heaven. He desires a larger family of created intelligences. All heaven took a deep and joyful interest in the creation of the world and of man. Human beings were a new and distinct order. They were made in the image of God and it was the Creator's design that they should populate the earth. The weekly cycle of seven literal days, six for labor and the seventh for rest, which has been preserved and brought down through Bible history, originated in the great fact of the first seven days. Ellen G. White comments in the SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 1, page 1081. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of His mouth. For he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. Psalm 33, verses 6 and 9. The Bible recognizes no long ages in which the earth was slowly evolved from chaos. Of each successive day of creation, the sacred record declares that it consisted of the evening and the morning, like all other days that have followed. At the close of each day is given the result of the Creator's work. The statement is made at the close of the first week's record. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created. Genesis chapter 2 verse 4. But this does not convey the idea that the days of creation were other than literal days. Each day was called a generation because that in it God generated or produced some new portion of His work. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 112. It is one of Satan's devices to lead the people to accept the fables of infidelity, for he can thus obscure the law of God, in itself very plain, and embolden men to rebel against the divine government. His efforts are especially directed against the fourth commandment because it so clearly points to the living God, the maker of the heavens and the earth. There is a constant effort made to explain the work of creation as the result of natural causes, and human reasoning is accepted even by professed Christians in opposition to plain scripture facts. There are many who oppose the investigation of the prophecies, especially those of Daniel and the Revelation, declaring them to be so obscure that we cannot understand them. Yet these very persons eagerly receive the suppositions of geologists in contradiction of the Mosaic record. But if that which God has revealed is so difficult to understand, how inconsistent it is to accept mere suppositions in regard to that which He has not revealed. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever. Deuteronomy chapter 29 verse 29. Just how God accomplished the work of creation, He has never revealed to men. Human science cannot search out the secrets of the Most High. His creative power is as incomprehensible as His existence. Patriarchs and Prophets, 
page 113. Wednesday, May 17. Creation, the Sabbath, and the End Time God's claim to reverence and worship above the gods of the heathen is based upon the fact that He is the Creator and that to Him all other beings owe their existence. Thus it is presented in the Bible. Says the prophet Jeremiah, The Lord is the true God. He is the living God and an everlasting God. The gods that have not made the heavens and the earth, even they shall perish from the earth and from under these heavens. He hath made the earth by his power, he hath established the world by his wisdom, and hath stretched out the heavens by his discretion. Jeremiah chapter 10 verses 10 to 12. The Sabbath as a memorial of God's creative power points to him as the maker of the heavens and the earth. Hence, it is a constant witness to his existence and a reminder of his greatness, his wisdom, and his love. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 336. The Sabbath is the only commandment in the whole Decalogue that tells who God is. It places God in distinction with every other God. It says the God that made the heaven and the earth, the God that made the trees and the flowers and that created man. This is the God that you are to keep before your children, and you have only to point to the flowers and tell them that he made these and that he rested on the seventh day from all his labors. The seventh day is a God-given memorial. Pointing to God as the maker of the heavens and the earth, it distinguishes the true God from all false gods. All who keep the seventh day signify by this act that they are worshipers of Jehovah. Thus the Sabbath is the sign of man's allegiance to God. Sons and Daughters of God, page 59. Like the Sabbath, the week originated at creation, and it has been preserved and brought down to us through Bible history. God himself measured off the first week as a sample for successive weeks to the close of time. Like every other, it consisted of seven literal days, Six days were employed in the work of creation. Upon the seventh, God rested, and he then blessed this day and set it apart as a day of rest for man. After giving the command, he states the reason for thus observing the week by pointing back to his own example. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Exodus chapter 20 verses 8 to 11. This reason appears beautiful and forcible when we understand the days of creation to be literal. The first six days of each week are given to man for labor because God employed the same period of the first week in the work of creation. On the seventh day, man is to refrain from labor in commemoration of the Creator's rest. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 111. Thursday, May 18, The Sabbath and Eternal Rest In the beginning, the Father and the Son had rested upon the Sabbath after their work of creation. When the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them, Genesis chapter 2 verse 1, the Creator and all heavenly beings rejoiced in contemplation of the glorious scene. The morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Job chapter 38, verse 7. Now Jesus rested in the tomb from the work of redemption. And though there was grief among those who loved him on earth, yet there was joy in heaven. Glorious to the eyes of heavenly beings was the promise of the future. A restored creation, a redeemed race, that having conquered sin could never fall, this, the result to flow from Christ's completed work, God and angels saw. With this scene, the day upon which Jesus rested is forever linked. When there shall be a restitution of all things which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began, Acts chapter 3 verse 21, the creation Sabbath, 
the day on which Jesus lay at rest in Joseph's tomb, will still be a day of rest and rejoicing. Heaven and earth will unite in praise as from one Sabbath to another, Isaiah chapter 66, verse 23, the nations of the saved shall bow in joyful worship to God and the Lamb. The Desire of Ages, page 769. All through the week, keep the Lord's holy Sabbath in view, for that day is to be devoted to the service of God. It is a day when the hands are to rest from worldly employment, when the soul's needs are to receive a special attention. The Sabbath. Oh, make it the sweetest, the most blessed day of the whole week. Parents can and should give attention to their children, reading to them the most attractive portions of Bible history, educating them to reverence the Sabbath day, keeping it according to the commandment. They can make the Sabbath a delight if they will take the proper course. My Life Today, page 287. God's holy rest day was made for man, and acts of mercy are in perfect harmony with its intent. God does not desire His creatures to suffer an hour's pain that may be relieved upon the Sabbath or any other day. The demands upon God are even greater upon the Sabbath than upon other days. His people then leave their usual employment and spend the time in meditation and worship. They ask more favors of Him on the Sabbath than upon other days. They demand His special attention. They crave His choicest blessings. God does not wait for the Sabbath to pass before He grants these requests. Heaven's work never ceases, and men should never rest from doing good. The Sabbath is not intended to be a period of useless inactivity. But as God ceased His labor of creating and rested upon the Sabbath and blessed it, so man is to leave the occupations of his daily life and devote those sacred hours to healthful rest, to worship, and to holy deeds. The Desire of Ages, page 207. For further reading, In Heavenly Places, Sanctifying Power, page 145, and That I May Know Him, God's Appointed Signature, page 211.